Hi, hello everybody. Welcome to, to the next session of the Visual Data Science Symposium. This is our interview session and it's my great pleasure to introduce you all to René Sieber. René holds a PhD from Rutgers University from 1997, if I recall correctly, in urban planning and policy analysis and is now a professor at McGill, has appointments both in geography and the School for the Environment and is also an an affiliate of the computer science department over there. But as we know, uh, Renee, she's very known in our community for public participatory GIS work, and now with a lot of interest and in very insightful work on both open data and the usage of open data, for instance, in the context of cities and decision-making in cities, and of course, in AI and GeoAI and counter AI and all the many terms that we are going to learn more about in the next 45-ish minutes. Renée and I are going to have an on-stage interview. This is very exciting, I guess, for, for, for hopefully for you, but very exciting for Renée and me, because you never know how this goes, so be gentle with us. But there's also a time for you to jump in, namely in the last 15-ish minutes. We are going to um, accept questions from you, the audience, and Renée is hopefully going to, to be kind enough to reply to at least some of those. Okay, that said, let's dive right into it. So I'm obviously very excited to, to have you here to do this interview format. We have done this a couple of times now, and the more we do this, the more I like it. And here's why I think we are learning in our domain, whether it's computer science or data science or GI science or geography, too often we are learning about people in paper-sized chunks. And that has a lot of disadvantages because the, fa the final paper hides all the process that went into it. It also hides all the maybe obstacles, maybe the things that didn't get published, the motivation, what made somebody write this piece of work and what that changed you know, to their own knowledge of the field, their understanding of their own research interest. So in these interviews, we want to learn more about the person behind the paper. What makes them write the papers? Why are they interested in something? What do they contribute to the broader uh, literature and so on and so forth? So, enough said. Renée, in just a, a couple of, of words, who are you as an academic and how may, what made you become that way or this person? Um, I got my undergraduate degree in uh, science. It was an all science college where you got exposure to as many sciences as possible. I then went on to own a machine shop and build toys, science fiction toys, mostly ray guns and robots. Honestly, I was building ray guns and robots. Of course, they were with blinky lights and helium neon lasers. Um, and I was in a poor neighborhood. Um, and I've always been a progressive and um, I've always been interested in trying to increase the power of marginalized people, of poor people. Um, and that's what drew me to the research that I do now. I'm very interested in the intersection of um, information and communication technologies. The more complicated, the better. And uh, sticking it to the man or woman or envy whoever is in power. That, that, that brings me to, to my follow-up question. And we are sitting here at the Viennese meeting and I'm sure everybody has their own opinion, but right now it's yours that matters. So I know that you are a science fiction fan. You told me during our last interview. So what is your least favorite, not the most favorite, the least favorite science fiction movie or book and why? Yeah, that was... <laughs> That was a really hard one for me to answer uh, because I tend to stay away from movies and books that I probably will not like. Um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the World Science Fiction Convention in um, Chicago. Um, so I heard, you know, from my favorite authors, <laughs> not from my least favorite authors, but uh, scratching my head, I guess my least favorite current television show is Raised by Wolves, which is uh, the executive producer is Ridley Scott of Alien fame and also the original Blade Runner. Um, 
uh, I am uh, I am a hard science fiction fan, or I love speculative fiction. I love good world building. Take an idea, mostly a scientific idea, and spin it out to create a consistent world. So a TV show like Raised by Wolves, which ostensibly had a good premise, a science fictional premise, and all of a sudden introduced a flying snake, um, a fantastical element in the middle, which just made me hate it because um, it's not consistent in the world unless the snake is sucking up uh, helium or hydrogen um, or has some anti-grav device in it, it's not going to work. So that's the answer to your question. I love world building. Yeah, my least favorite is certainly the new Star Wars, and, and I hope that resonates with some of you guys here. Okay, so I guess in, in, in 2020, many of us are working on topics like geoethics, bias, geoprivacy, and some of us may have been doing so for many years, and some of us are only learning about the importance of these topics and what they mean for the individual researcher and so on. But I think it's very important that we also hear about what some of these terms mean from people who don't work on these topics in an, let me say, almost opportunistic fashion. I believe this is a criticism that we need to, to take serious as scientists, that sometimes we are jumping between buzzwords and jumping to ethics as a buzzword doesn't seem very ethical to me. So from somebody who really knows what they are talking about, Rene, can you give us a brief walk through, through topics like ethical AI, counter AI, responsible AI, and terms like that? Um, when, well, I want to start by talking about briefly the difference between data ethics in AI or geo AI ethics. So one of the, because they are not the same and one doesn't necessarily build on the other, um, it's not necessarily about making sure your data is accurate and complete. AI ethics is as is really about the ethics of power, um, or one could say the fairness of impacts. So you can see when you when you move from privacy and data quality to fairness of impacts you're introducing a different element you're introducing a human rights element and that pervades some of these topics now it's hard to talk about responsible ai um i can't remember all the terms now um the they're often used as a cover for what a, or a checkbox for what firms do. We talked to some people, uh, we considered some fairness issues um, or some data quality issues. So we're good. Um, so um, one has to be really careful when one uses these terms, responsible AI comes out of the business ethics community and while we want to give credit to the com business community for doing right by people, it's often a lot more driven by um, protecting against uh, reputational risk than anything else. Um, critical AI and counter AI is really us in the geography and the spatial data science community looking at the potential or trying to anticipate the impacts of our work and the assumptions underlying um, the way the data was collected, the feature engineering of the data and the ultimate use. So it does not give us a pass to build whatever we want because the sandbox is fun. We actually have to game out the impacts and game out what's driving us or, or if we're working as a consultant, um, what's driving our employer to build X application or X platform. Counter AI really to me is about um, marginalized people taking the AI under their wing and using it to counter power. Um, so um, one of the few examples I found is just a guy, but a techie in Washington state in the US 
using uh, facial recognition technology to identify police officers who've taken their badges off and shut off their cameras. Um, so you can see why this is a counter AI. It's still, even counter AIs can be problematic because we'd like to think of community-based organizations as all doing good constructive work and, and they're not, and they have their own biases, but it really is about shifting the power dynamics. And it's more than, oh, we're inclusive, right? Because we've passively harvested a lot of people's data it's really people are given collaboratory and um, power to control the discourse in the development and the design of the technology. But I, I really like what you said because there are two important things here, many of course more, but two, thing, two things that I believe are often confused, namely the ethics of geo-AI or ethics of spatial data science is not geo-ethics, that sounds like a fancy term, but it actually means something else, right, as you pointed out. And I also like what you said about counter-AI. This is a term that I'm really unfamiliar with. You introduced me to the term a couple of weeks ago. But now I wonder, in your definition, is counter-AI the use of AI technologies in the sense to counter power structure? Because then I, I, I like this and I agree with this because this is a positive spin of AI and you know that I think that AI is an empowering a democratization technology or is it countering AI with, so to speak, either AI or not AI terms? Do you see where I'm trying to go? Yeah, it's both. It's both of those things. We sometimes we think of innovations of coming out of the head of Zeus or Hera, um, like they have their own momentum, but they don't. We make decisions about developing, and I'm not talking about application here, about developing platform X, about adding 19 more hidden layers to neural network Y. Um, so, in, and um, we don't have a million hours in the day. Uh, we might have like a million crowdsourcers. That may be another question we could talk, uh, we could address, but um, we're making decisions all the time as a society to build one technology over another. And we need to question that. And we need to also question the assumptions that we bake into the construction of a neural network, for example. Um, for example, why must neural networks be efficient? Why are we driven by things, performance issues? Um, it just seems logical that we would, but we need to question these very baseline assumptions that we have about building these things. So the answer is both. Thanks. Yes, it reminds me a lot about the, the, the famous book from Hans Jonas about bioethics and ethics in medicine. I think that's something that is really worth revisiting, even though the book is, I believe, from the 80s. So moving on to the broader... But, but just let, me, let me just add one thing that often we use ethics as a code word for morality. Ethics are not a code word for morality. Ethics, when we borrow it, and philosophers are not always happy that we do borrow it, is a part of metaphysics. It is essentially a logical argument. So you can have ethics that enable repression, that enable death camps, right? That you can have this logical argument that leads to that inevitable universal conclusion. So I think we have to be quite careful overall when we just say ethics are about morality and then we all say, oh, we're all good people. And anyway, just as an aside. No, I, I think I get this and this is an important distinction. And also keep in mind for us as geographers, the, the cultural underpinning is always very important, right? And obviously then coming up with a single definition of what is you know, part of your society's moral code is a different argument than what's ethics in general, right? So going a little bit broader and looking at the entire domain of spatial data science, over the last five years, and you can also say 10 if you like, what is your most striking insight or what surprised you most from a paper, from a talk, from own thinking? 
Yeah, I think the most surprising thing has been the inference of space to place. Um, I mean, we're awash in so much data now that we think we know place, but we don't. But there seems to be this undercurrent that we can now describe all the nuances of place um, and also baked into that is um, causality and I think that there is a kind of this creeping causality is because we're replacing place with space we're now starting to say because we're seeing this very fine grain intimate portrait of a person, we now know why the person or why the animal or why the object is moving, for example. And I think we have to resist that. Yeah, so would, I, would, I, would it be fair if I would paraphrase what you said as a critique that there are concepts like place, for instance, that are semantically and culturally very rich, but we often default to representations that are lower or easier to express, more spatial representations like locations, labels for places, names, something like this, simply because they're easy to compute on, right? And thereby we are doing a lot of harm by making wrong inferences about people and their behavior and their cultures. Yeah, I think so. I don't know if this is a difference in kind or a difference in degree. I think that we can say something about the big data that we have now that makes it too easy to slip into this association, this more complete representation. I mean, we've often laughed at the concept of the one-to-one -one map, but maybe we need to vi revisit the one-to-one -one map in terms of representation because we know so much about people, which also then means we can nudge people in very subtle or not so subtle ways. Yeah, and, and who decides who, who does the nudging? We had the discussion about this earlier today. Very interesting. So I think that ethics and how it, the implications it has is one thing, but then suddenly when it impacts us as researchers and we are being asked to, for instance, foresee potential consequences of our work, then it touches another term that is very important for us as scientists, namely academic freedom, right? A term that is also, by the way, very often misread or misunderstood. So where is academic freedom in 2022? And are there, do you see there are borders for academic freedom? Well, I mean, I, if I put, I'm the president of our faculty association. So I have a very different spin on the concept of academic freedom. First of all, because I'm in Canada, the land of Jordan Peterson. So issues of university academic freedom are rife. And also I'm in Quebec where um, we have ostensibly academic freedom, but there's also a, cla a clause in the employment contracts uh, in the province that say you have to be loyal to your employer. So you can have academic freedom and also violate that loyalty. Uh, so it's really tricky when I put my president's hat on, but when I put on my research hat on, I can read that is, do we have the academic freedom or should associations support academic freedom to do any kind of spatial data science work that we might choose? And I would say that's problematic because you're not gaming out the implications. We often talk, and I mean, and I'm a geographer now, but I, my degree was in urban planning. And when we talk in urban planning a lot about externality, certainly we live in the, land, in, the air, in the existential crisis of climate change where we've given so many countries and private sector firms a pass in embedding the externalities, right? It's just like grab the oil out and don't worry about the impacts or don't build the cost of the impacts in. And I don't think we can have academic freedom without building in the externalities of our research. 
Interesting. Thank you very much. To 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 spin off of that, I think that Rene and I talked quite quite frequently, or at least occasionally, over the past uh, couple of years. And we always promised to ourselves that we are going to to bring the knives, as we said, to have some you know violent disagreement, and then we we just find ourselves agreeing and and and, and, and having interesting and fun discussions. But last time when we, when we talked with with Jeremy, I think that finally found something where we do disagree to a point where you know it's worth of having a debate, and I mean this in a most positive sense. And that's this idea that algorithms are neutral or aren't. To briefly introduce the audience to, to what I mean by that, my argument basically boils down to, we talked, Rene mentioned shortest path on neural network architectures, and I said, well, shortest path is just a deterministic algorithm, whether it's applied to human movements or whether it's traffic or whatever, it's just a sequence of instructions that end under certain you know, termination uh, constraints in an endless amount of steps. And whether you apply it to A or B, that's really up to you. And for neural networks, my argument is this is just matrix multiplication and a little bit of calculus. So the, the whole strength of neural network is that prior to training, if you just take the building blocks of what will, what will later become a neural architecture, they are so successful because they are domain agnostic. It's almost the same system that you train whether you do image classification or another task obviously there are differences but it boils down to very similar math and to my surprise Renee disagreed quite a bit with this saying that she's not going to let me get away with technology it's not technology that I that I would disagree but but with the algorithm is neutral and that that shocked me a little bit but I'm I began to understand and I thought that this is maybe an interesting discussion not to reproduce but at least to start because I think that many may not be aware of the arguments. So what are your counter arguments? I say algorithms are neutral. They are just sets of instructions. It's the people who either do harm with them or not. Right. So often, I'm in Canada, I'm not in the US. Often people will say um, in the US that guns don't kill people, people kill people. So human beings build tools and it is the application of the tools the tools themselves are neutral um but to me the tools themselves the technology the algorithms are not neutral one issue is opportunity costs of building one technology versus another Another is whom does the technology serve? And I'm not talking about the application. Who does the underlying technology serve? Who does it serve to be able to use Google Ways to get quickly from one place to another without understanding the road, the, the place through which you're traveling? Um, so, I, are, I had mentioned efficiency. Efficiency is a, an economic biased term. Why do we want things to be efficient? Why do we want things to be fast? Why do we want to ignore things? Why do we want convenient things? Every one of these things has embeds assumptions in it. That's why I say there is no neutral algorithm. You use the word deterministic. Why, in, and in geography, there are huge arguments about what's called geographic determinism. There are arguments in the science and technology studies community about technological determinism. Yev Yevgeny Morozov wrote a book on technological solutionism and on how not only do we look to technology to solve our problems, but we, free, we reframe problems so they suit the technology. So the technology no longer serves a problem. It, it, it is, you know, the technology drives the problem and the solution. Um, Riddle and Weber wrote a formative article on wicked problems. And we've seen revisiting of the wicked problems problems <laughs> over time. And the problem of wicked problems is they're wicked, is that you can't, you know, for example, articulations of a problem. 
change dependent upon what community you ask, when you're asking the question, because they evolve. Um, they're they're non-divisible. Um, so there are innate natures of certain kinds of issues, especially issues to which we're applying spatial data science and geographic information science to that are not reducible. And yet we're looking constantly to these technologies to reduce the problem. Representation is a reduction. We accept that in geography, we accept that in many fields, but we have to examine the assumptions. That's why I will not buy the argument that we can reduce stuff to matrix algebra because you know there we have to continually be sort of gaming out the assumptions that we bring to this it's been geography has got a lot to answer for over time you know cartography has a lot to answer for which behooves each one of us even the most techie of us to do a pause for even a moment to examine some of those assumptions Yep, I actually, I, I, you know, I, I thought a lot about this after our last discussion, and I always think that it would need to have some sort of follow-up event, not like the interview that we're having right now, because that's too short, not what we had with Jeremy. It would need a, a longer conversation, because some of those arguments, like you, for instance, saying, well, that's just like the guns don't kill people do, I think they deserve a, a longer discussion. So let me give you a, a quick answer, knowing that I will not be able to address all of this, because you said so many interesting things. I think they would deserve a full hour with multiple people. So here are my brief answers. So when we look at what computer science truly is, then computer science can be summarized, as I say often, by two words, scalability and abstraction, right? Scalability that you can run something repeatedly very often. This is the, the entire black magic of neural networks is basically this, you do it millions of times, right? Very simple steps. And the second is abstraction. And what I mean by that is that whether you are standing in line at the grocery store, or you're standing in line at you know the the car repair shop, or you're standing in line in front of the teller at the at the bank. It's always the same, namely that when you come first, you will be served first. In contrast, when you stack things, then suddenly this principle changes. The things stop on uh, you know put on top will leave the stack first, and you know where I'm going. Queues and stacks and FIFA and FIFA and stuff like this, right? But I think. This is the entire strength and magic of computer science. And then if you look at the shortest part, and that's why you know, it, it, it was so hard for me to understand what you meant is, if you look at structurally what the shortest path Dijkstra's algorithm, for instance, does is, it's very similar to, for instance, search, right? Efficient search over graph structures or other order sets in general, right? So I believe that if you would blame, so if you would give a, a responsibility to shortest path, then you also have to go and give responsibility to any kind of search, like binary search or anything like this. And if we haven't, if you know, if you can't do that without taking some ethical responsibility, then you can't basically do anything, right? And same for neural networks. Their entire power is that before training, there's really nothing there aside of you know chunks of math. And back to the deterministic part. Actually, I think this is something that is really interesting and that we often don't consider. Obviously, not all algorithms are strongly deterministic, right? So, for instance, what is often forgotten that there are, there are some edge cases. If you really look into implementations, for instance, DB scan, which I guess most of us use almost every day or week, in edge cases, it's non deterministic, right? So, I, I get that there are things to be modeled or to be understood, right? But I, I see where the guns don't kill people argument fails for computing is that a gun is a device made to kill, and obviously you can kill for good, which you know is maybe an odd concept, but you can certainly kill for bad. But something as basic as multiplying you know, matrices and vectors or something like this, that for me has to have the right to be neutral, because if that isn't, what is? Do you see my, my approach as a car? Yeah, I mean, I'm... Okay, I'm not a complete deconstructionist. For me, it is not turtles all the way down. Well, it kind of is turtles all the way down, but it's not, right? Um, so I get your point and I get the practicality. Um, the, the challenge is 
that we're often not given the space and the power to reflect on what we do. Where we draw the line at practicality is also important. So I prefer to think of that line as fluid and maybe should be pushed a little bit further down than we're comfortable with. And a lot of this is comfort. A lot of this is reward structures. Um, you know, I'm not rewarded for investigating deeper, for interrogating deeper. My department is all white, so I'm not, you know, necessarily interested in thinking about the racial implications. And of course, that's an application. Um, I'm not also interested in uh, the implications for transfer learning, for example, in AI. In many, in many cases, we should be very concerned about um, how easily things are interoperable or how easy things are supposedly transferred or repurposable. I, I think we need to question that. So I don't have an easy answer to where the line is. I grant that there is a line. But I'm not willing to say that X discipline is perfectly neutral and every other discipline is biased or X discipline is neutral. So perhaps there are a whole bunch of other disciplines that are neutral. Yeah, I, I, I do get your point. And I also think that sometimes it's a little bit of a semantic confusion between people who use terms in different ways. I think often when people talk about the algorithm, then they mean like why their YouTube videos are getting the views they're getting or why is Facebook suggesting something to them. And that's strictly speaking, not an algorithm. That's why I also take sometimes offense with the term learning and machine learning or training. It's a parameterization of a model, right? And I think that sometimes that, that's a little bit easy to, to confuse. But there's another concept that I think- Hold on, hold on, hold on a moment. Many, if these algorithms, because we often in our minds think of algorithms as equations, especially when we move to neural networks, what we're talking about meshes of probabilities. And because the meshes of probabilities, if they're based on classificatory algorithms, they're based on prior data, okay, fine, maybe an application, but the algorithm itself will doesn't exist. It's not a thing, it's not a neutral thing without the mesh of probabilities, the training and retraining. And if a algorithm is optimized for fear, which there's a problem for many of these big tech companies, um, then we should be questioning that. Why are they deliberately or inadvertently driving uh, clicks, um, recommendations by fear? or by body dysmorphia, for example. I, I understand and I absolutely share this point and, and the fear factor there. What I meant to say is that something like if I give you a pre-trained model, let's say one of those gigantic language models that are so in vogue right now, for me, that's not an algorithm, right? That's a pre-trained model and that's an important distinction, I believe. So and can, have, can embed biases as well. Oh, absolutely, right? But it's just that when we talk about agency and then sometimes people say that algorithms have agency or something like this, that's what's, you know, rubbing me backwards, so to speak. You see where I'm coming from? Well, I think they have momentum. Therefore, I think they have a kind of agency. So I'm rubbing it the wrong way then. <laughs> That's good. That's why we are here, right? And I hope we will continue doing this many, many times. I'm learning every time from you, so thank you very much. There's another term that I think we both dislike, if I remember correctly, but for different reasons. So maybe it's another one where we can, you know, have a little bit of a of a fight, but but be essentially on the right, of, on, on the same side. And that's human in the loop. I really dislike the term because I think it's an illusion. It's when people try to find spots where humans still matter because for some reason they have panic that humans may not matter. And then they say, but we can have humans in the loop to improve this or improve that, or machines still need humans in one way or the other. And I think that's a, that's a dangerous illusion. But you criticized the term more from your previous work in, uh, in participatory GIS. And that was very interesting to me in our last discussion. So maybe we can go back and, and explain to us what, what do you dislike about this idea of human or maybe even society in the loop, right? That's what... what what you're talking about. I dislike 
the concept because I don't think we examine the assumptions and we examine the origin points and whether the original definition has shed its baggage sufficiently to become um, an author who talked about community in the loop and someone else talked about a society in the loop. But human in the loop was really about crowdsourcing and crowd workers, refining algorithms, fine tuning algorithms. So it's what Mona Sloan calls participation as work. So we include people there where we've gotten people to participate because they've been involved in creating the um, uh, labeling image data sets for the training data, for example. And that to me uh, can persist when we try to rehabilitate human in the loop. It was predominantly workers compensated or not, but even, you know, ghost workers, people who are poorly compensated, we don't know their material conditions. Um, we don't know what kinds of horrific um, videos or content they're being exposed to. So we can externalize them and yet call what we're doing participatory because we're employing Hiddle, uh, human in the loop. So that is uh, my main complaint about it. Um, and add on top of that, that people have often talked about it in terms of human oversight. So the human here is the decision maker. In it often, um, there was a study in Poland that showed that um, of all the claims of human oversight in the algorithms, uh, I can't remember, it was like 90% had no human oversight. Um, so, you know, you, you can actually empirically test that and find out whether there is any oversight or not. But traditionally, the H has not referred to decision makers. It has referred to ghost workers or crowd workers. So many of the things that, that we are discussing today and that I think you may be reading in the press or that, that are catching a lot of attention because, as you said, the, some of the mechanisms that, that create our information bubbles are driven by, by fear, pain and negative light on AI, which always makes me quite sad. I think it's the exit, exact opposite, right? So if I would have to ask you, and you can really only name the positive, that's the challenge. What is the most positive impact AI or GeoAI technology will do to either human society or to our field of geography by 2030? Yeah, probably I would point to um, um, the use of AI in medical diagnostic tools. Um, uh, so because we have more mechanical diagnostic tools out there and we have fewer and fewer workers examining them, um, <clears throat> um those imagery that imagery so the ability of ai to um detect uh, tumors or to detect um other kinds of um diseases in people would be good uh, i do continue to worry because <laughs> i'm a glass half empty kind of person about um, whether or not that will only be available to the wealthy so that it will perpetuate a, um, an income divide um, and also what um, gets baked into the, um, into the detection because uh, it's largely based, based on classification algorithms and we're training it on biased data. I mean, one of the big problems we have with training data is that there are some data sets that you cannot computationally debias. And unfortunately, there are aspects in medicine that were incredibly, well, continue to be incredibly racist. And if we're using that as ground truth, uh, accurate data, that's kind of a problem. And you only have to look to countries like the US where um, black people were expected to be able to uh, feel less pain, have tougher skin. 
that gets baked into the diagnostics. Um, you know, up to including um, there is a case in the U.S. where um, black people were being denied uh, organ transplants because the training data had said they're higher risk. Well, you know, why are a why are they higher risk? And B is there a bias in the data originally that we've built accreted all of these AI systems on top of. And here we're talking about applications. And one of the challenges working with this stuff is you and I, we're never working with the baseline AI. We're always working with a you know, software library that has been you know, one algorithm on top of another algorithm. And then we sprinkle in some kind of performance algorithm or optimization algorithm. So you know, we need to sort of try as much as we can to pierce those layers of black boxes to figure out what we're actually giving to people. Interesting, yeah. So uh, going back to what you said at the beginning when we still had the positive spin on the entire story, that you thought that it would help for medicine, but then you said, but you are unsure that it would be only available for the wealthy. And I think this is where, where, where things get really interesting because my argument is always the other way around. It's the scalability of AI systems of computing that will make it available to the masses, right? A doctor is damn expensive, especially in the US. The software can almost at scale, if at scale, run for free, right? This is, of course, not you know, diminishing the importance of all the arguments about bias and you know, accountability that you made. But I think that part that I do believe will happen, that things will get less expensive through, uh, through uh, automatization. So I'm, I'm very, very hopeful for this. And then there's a second thing that I think is interesting. If you look at, for instance, I believe it's Kahneman and Tversky's work, but obviously we are doing this online here and everybody can look, look it up and prove me wrong, that have shown that the best indicator of whether you're going to get parole or not from a parole judge, you know, if you're in jail, is whether they had lunch before seeing you or after seeing you. So how far in hours they were away from the last lunch, the, the more hours, the worse outcome for you. So I personally, I take any AI over over a human being in many, many, many cases. We are, as, as Kahneman and Tversky show in many cases, irrational agents. And for a society or societies as big as ours and with so many diverse needs, I'm not sure whether actually humans are the best decision makers. Also, if you look at, you mentioned climate change as existential crisis before. I'm not so sure how competent we are. I, I'm not sure whether I don't leave this better to the machines. Uh, you can kind of guess <laughs> what my answer would be. <laughs> Um, right. I'm a science fiction fan. I've read a lot of science fiction and there's certainly a lot of um, science fiction stories in which people are governed by machines, whether they're AI or whether they're manifest in robots and how bad that turns out. Um, it, turns, it turns out badly. First of all, I don't buy that scalability is important. I buy that it is a, it's an attribute uh, or it's a driver of a discipline, but I don't buy that it's important. Um, so, I mean, we can have a much longer discussion about that. Um, but um, <clears throat> if it's classificatory algorithm is a based on past data, then an AI is going to be as biased as a human is. Um, Virginia Eubank says that AIs actually better customize and amplify the bias. So they're more efficient at being biased than we are. They're more, um, you look at the famous Amazon HR case study where Amazon was looking to um, um, de-bias their hiring process, especially at the initial stage where they were triaging uh, applications and they fed the class of it, you know, they classified it on the bat basis of uh, prior successful resumes, of course, from white men or from Asian men, even though Amazon wanted to hire more women and um, other minorities. 
and they found that the AI was picking out women's colleges and mention of women's in the CVs because it wasn't in the successful applications. Even when they computationally biased, debiased it, well, actually they de feature engineered the data to remove those explicit references because it was using NLP, natural language processing, it was picking up the construction of sentences and the way that women were acculturated to speak more um, uh, tentatively in their resumes, in their CVs. So um, it was still biasing the results, still selecting white men and Asian men instead of selecting other minorities and women. So, um, so that's the bias part. And also when you move to something like reinforcement learning, uh, one of the things that, uh, for which XAI or explainable AI has been so useful is it's it's tried to um, glass box the black box to figure out why reinforcement AI um, uh, makes the decisions it does. So we think that the neural networks think like we do. They do not think like we do because in large part, because we're giving them different metrics to determine the quality of the outcomes. So they could have wildly different determinations that essentially like kills everybody in this marginalized community because it's not efficient to serve them from a government perspective. So do I want to be governed by an AI? Do I think that a no, do I think that AIs are going to be less biased than human beings? No. Do I think we know enough about how AI thinks so that we can hand over our lives and our deaths? to an AI, no. Yeah, I think you're know, right. It's a question of degrees, right? I would certainly trust modern day AI with my next cancer diagnosis more than a human, right? I think I would also trust an autopilot on a plane more than, than a human. And I think five years from now, most likely I'm going to trust uh, a, a autopilot in a car more than a human driver. But as you said, there are many, many counter examples where you wouldn't do this, right? But I think one thing- But, I, but I, I, would not, I would not trust an AI with, say, my breast cancer diagnosis if there was no human oversight to check it, because we still have a considerable amount of false positives and false negatives. So I would still want a human being to look at it in part because maybe the human being learns something from how the AI thinks. So there is some amount of interaction that is valuable as well as oversight. I, I, I totally agree. But the last point I wanted to mention where things became a little bit more controversial, right, where, where you, you talked about, you know, men and women and hyacinths and so forth. I think this, I totally understand with this. I totally understand this. I agree with this. I see the bias issues. There's interesting work on this. We also work on this. I, you know, you have me 100%. But one thing I have to say, let's not blame the AI, right? The AI uses data and the data encodes deep racism because there's deep racism in parts of society. The data is always about the parts, right? So sometimes when we ask, why. Well, why is this AI spitting out something that is that is either racial or discriminatory? Well, because that's how society unfortunately was or maybe still is in many cases, right? So I think again the, the bias sits less in the algorithm, and I know we are going, not going to agree on this. It sits on the selection of data for training. And now you're going to say, well, how do I select an un, an unbiased data set? There isn't one. And and this is the winning argument. I totally agree. So the application of AI and the usage of data and the selection of algorithms is what I see as sources of danger. The, the algorithm as such, this is really, for me, just mad. Yeah, I still blame the AI. That's very good. Then we have something for, for the next discussion. I have many more questions, and, and, and you know this, and we only have a little bit of time, and, and Kitty should tell me that we only have a little bit of time left any second now, and I wanted to also have questions from the audience. But I have one that I thought is funny and that I want to use to end this. So five years from now, a student on YouTube will watch us talk and they will play it twice the speed, as I'm sure you know. And then after playing it five minutes for twice the speed, they will still think they need to jump over to the last five minutes because there will be some ultimate conclusion. So the student arrives at the last five minutes playing on twice the speed. You have one sentence. 
for them to remember what they should keep in mind about ethics in their next GOAI project? What will this be? Uh, first of all, they won't be watching on YouTube because YouTube won't be around in five years. They'll be watching on some analog to TikTok. Um, oh, no. And they probably, no, won't have to, they won't, right? They probably won't have to speed speed it up because the videos will be so short. So, um, have skeptical skepticism of AI. Protect whistleblowers. Um, and encourage more unions in firms that do AI. Actually, because you said TikTok, I was on a tram and the person in front of me was watching TikTok. I was never so frightened in my entire life. Okay, up to, to the audience. So thank you very much, Rene. That was fantastic. I could talk to you for hours. I hope there will be a chance to do this in, in person again and maybe to do this in a format which allows you know a longer discussion where ideas can slowly develop. I really enjoy talking to you, a, a fantastic communicator and speaker, and you were, and I think this is very important for me personally to say, you were involved in many of these topics when it was difficult to be involved in these topics, where these topics didn't attract very large audiences, didn't attract multi-million of funding, right? So next time, folks, you jump opportunistically on the next topic, keep in mind that there are some people who are worth listening to who have done it for a damn long time before you. Thank you so much, Rene. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And we are looking for your questions in the, in the Q&A. And I know that typing these in will always take you a couple of seconds. So do we have one already, Kitty? What's one oh. thing you wish data scientists understood about spatial data science that they often don't? Um, that uh, spatial data is not just um, three or four columns in a CSV, uh, X, Y, Z, and T. Um, um, that there's topology and geometry. In fact, um, that um, most hidden layers, most neural network architectures do not respect topology, geomet geometry. Um, Yana would add semantics uh, in the way that we respect these concepts. So we're having to retrofit these after the fact. I think if I would may add something, I would also add that the entire convolution as such is already spatial, which is so easy to forget for, for our non-spatial folks. So always think that we are the application domain. I think they are the application domain, right? Convolution is a spatial concept after all. Okay, Simon. I, Why does she not think that? Well, this is to you. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question. I, I haven't really taken. I think that this is a semantic misunderstanding, Simon. I think that being neutral or not is not about having a purpose or not. The the argument where Rene and I disagree is that I think something like computing the shortest path is domain agnostic because you can make the shortest path in a network of friends. You can make the shortest path. In, in a street network, right? Or you can use very similar approaches for as basic functionality as search. I think the responsibility is in training the people to properly use technologies, to understand biases, to foresee future harm they may be doing. But I don't think, and I think this is a really important part where Rene and I disagree, and it's good to have a disagreement, right? Keep in mind, even in 2020, disagreement is what makes academics right, right? I believe an algorithm has no agency. And this is, I think, the, the discussion that we were having. I, I hope, Simon, this, this clarifies this. Rene, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think that um, you, OK, I'm going to be gentle. I think you're conflating domain agnosticism with neutrality. And I think that we have different definitions, ontological differences be, around the concept of neutrality. Just because something can be applied across domains doesn't mean to me that it's neutral. It has it has a purpose, and often, in in fact, so being domain agnostic can be a problem because what happens is it becomes domain appropriation, 
without understanding all the baggage the particular function has. So we appropriate for our own convenience without pulling along all the other content about something. So now that we are talking about, about semantics, and we can also maybe bring Simon if he wants on stage because I'm not 100% sure I'll get his next questions, which you guys can't yet see, but, but Renee and I do. Um, so for instance, I, I teach software engineering and object-oriented modeling and stuff like this. And one thing that we do in one of our classes, we really implement, because I think you're absolutely right, Renee, that often we, we stack architectures on top of each other. And that's really, you know, there's a, a lot of danger in encoding bias and then not being able to track it back because it's so deeply stacked in whatever we do. But in this class, we do everything from scratch. We, for instance, implement, which I think geographers don't do often enough data structures from scratch, which is, I think, one of the most important parts of all of computing. So they learn how to implement, for instance, a linked list, a doubly linked list, an array list, what the difference is, a queue, a stack. And then we apply it to so many different application areas. Last year or two years ago, in fact, we did a cellular automaton to model the spread of COVID, right? This is what I mean by that it has no agency in its domain, agnostic or neutral. The Q is the Q is the Q is the Q. And I can use the very same model, the same, very same data structure with its very same properties in terms of the complexity of operations, like adding or searching within the stack or a list, whether this is a queue of people or a queue of books or a stack of people or a stack of, of I don't know, silverware or whatnot, right? This is what I mean. Yeah, so I tend to, this is a complete mapping, but I tend to think about Bruno Latour in Science in Action, the way he talks about black boxes as a form of agency. So he talks about how certain concepts as they stack on top of each other, you no longer refer to the assumptions, you no longer refer to who actually coined the concept. Uh, so they achieve this momentum and they achieve this kind of neutrality and they become a black box in their own right that you don't feel the need to pierce the box to figure out what you know why did someone decide to do it this way and not this way yeah but totally you know i we 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 need to have a drink together because i think you know that i'm also going to challenge you about this black box notion i think this is also something where where often when you read this in the press it's described backwards right that obviously once you have the result you can't easily go back and explain why the results came to be by the way that's also not true anymore in 2020 completely but that i get but forward looking in a network, we know exactly step by step we can, in fact, if we are just, you know, if we have millions of years, run the entire neural network on your home, you know, calculator on your phone by doing all the math. So forward, we know strictly step by step what every single part will do, right? But there's a very interesting question in your opinions, and maybe you can bring this up to the screen. In your opinion, how can combined methods, so qualitative and quantitative, be the solution. Uh, Rene, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, well, first of all, um, we, we don't know what's going inside on inside the black box right now. We only have the coarsest measures of what's happening when we're looking at gradients, when we're looking at SHAP values, when we're looking at visualizations, we only have these snapshots. We only have these coarse unitary measures. So we don't know the full extent of the interactions of, of all the neurons. Um, so there may be a time in which we can have... The problem is when we're talking about greater prediction from input to outcome, um, it's still, there's still a black box there. We've tuned, we've maybe hyper-parameterized the system, so it's got great accuracy, but I, you know, I'm, I'm always going back to the cats and dogs issue in how the, these original um, classifications of cats versus dogs, when they started to look inside the black box was really about lighting conditions because dogs were being photographed outside more than cats are being photographed. So you actually had to eventually go back and, you know, not accept that it was a high performing classification. 
um, can combine or how can they combine methods be the solution? Yeah, I think that they, that's definitely a way to go. Um, it's, there is a question of how the qualitative best interacts with the quantitative when the quantitative is incredibly black boxed. Um, when your qualitative analysis or methods only have certain uh, predefined insertion points into the algorithm. But I think that is the best solution, um, both from um, a sometimes malign participatory design stage, which is supposed to happen at the very beginning, to explainability at the outcome and everything in between. For me, it's still more about power, political power and influence than it is about selecting the right combination of methods. Yeah, I, there's, there's so much interesting to, to follow up here. And unfortunately, we are running out of time and there are many interesting questions. The next one from, from Anna, for instance, so it's probably worth to go to one of those tables and continue the discussion there. But let me close with, with a reply to, to what you said about the cats and dogs. And actually, I think that's an interesting part because if you look at modern thinking about emergent semantics, where does meaning really come from? Why do you know things in language mean something? And why is it so difficult for us as knowledge engineers to define them? Then you see in the literature from Barcelona and others ideas like simulated, uh, situated simulation and many others, right, which all point to the fact that, yes, in fact, maybe a good description for what is a cat and what is a dog, maybe that dogs or cats are photographed more inside also. It's the entire network of, of facts that gives richness to, to semantic and human expression. So actually, I would rather think that's a, that's a very cool feature of, of, of neural networks if they can pick up on, on the lighting. But with that said, and many more questions and many well, more let, things. Let me just, yes. let me just add yeah. one bit. So possibly the best use of AI is to uncover our biases, to look to backcast instead of forecast, um, and to, to allow agencies, researchers to use it to see where we were racist or misogynist or discriminatory. And instead of then trying to create a better AI to create a more sympathetic society. You know, I had a really well worked out ending for this, but you beat me to it. If there's nothing to add, I think that has been a perfect ending statement. And I think this, this should be it. I really love what you said there. Thank you very much.